sauce. In the kitchen whipping sauce. In the kitchen whipping sauce. Whipping, whipping, whipping sauce. Whipping, whipping sauce. Text the dripping with the sauce. The dripping with the sauce. Finesse and getting it with the sauce. Getting it with the sauce. In the kitchen whipping sauce. In the kitchen whipping sauce. Whipping, whipping, whipping sauce. Whipping, whipping sauce. My texture dripping with my sauce. Dripping with the sauce. Welcome to Chef Life TV, ladies and gentlemen. Today, um, I have to do audio podcast. I can't shoot in the studio because of the coronavirus, sad to say. So today, I have a caller from Vancouver. Uh, I've, I've known this chef for since 2015, I want to say. Yeah. So, good. yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, Chef Dion Asensio. Did I say that right? Yeah, you did. All Perfect. Right. Thank you. I thought, I thought. Cool, nice. cool, cool. Happy to be here. Ah, thanks. Listen, man. Listen. I, you know, since I have to do audio, I much rather get in contact with people that I can't be on the show, right? I gotta take advantage mm-hmm. of that. So let's let's jump right into it, man. Uh, talk to me about um Vancouver, man. Like, I know it's been a foodie town for the longest, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, sorry, man. Go ahead. Do you feel like you guys are in competition with like Quebec and stuff like that, or Montreal? Uh, you know, I feel like it's comparing apples to oranges when we say things like that. You know, like uh, Vancouver itself, it has a much more diverse culture. I feel like than the East Coast and Vancouver, especially Uh, the way I describe it to people, you know, kind of across the U.S. is we have uh, the melting pot of different cultures. We have like that L.A. type feel, but we still also have that urban, uh, you know, kind of New York architecture and structure. Uh, So with that being said, you've got people that are just coming straight across the border from Asia. You know, we've got neighborhoods out here that are literally like if you walk through the streets, it would feel like you were actually back in China or you would feel like you were actually, you know, at a street market in Japan. Like you you can actually get that feeling here uh, depending on where you're at. So I feel like it's super more diverse. Now, if we go East Coast, especially in Canada, you're going to get a lot of the traditional Europeans, right? Like you've got a lot of the French people kind of coming over again, Mm. French Canada, right? Mm. So over here is more that Asian influence. Over there, I feel like is a lot more European. So you guys have a more like hipster vibe, huh? I would say so. Yeah, I would definitely say so. I feel like, uh, you know, the the hipster vibe is is definitely a thing. There's certain neighborhoods out here that you definitely see that. Uh, but I feel like it's just a more eclectic palette and collection of people, you know, and culture. I mean, yeah, because you, you could be fucking hiking or snowboarding within the same day. It's insane. Oh, 100%, man. I mean, you could go snowboarding in the morning and have dinner on the beach at night. You know what I mean? In shorts and a t-shirt, like, without a problem. That's fucking crazy. I love that. So, how long have you been in Vancouver? Uh, I got to Vancouver in 2013. Uh, so, about seven years on and off. Uh, I did go down to the U.S. for a stint, and I was in Florida for about... Two and a half years of the, of that time. You was with Earls, right? Helping them open up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, love that. I think you and I were in talks at that point of being like, "Yo, you wanted to hop on that corporate train," and absolutely I was kind of giving you the the rundown of that. But yeah, I did that. I, let me tell you something, man. I regret not jumping on that train, man. <laughs> <laughs> You know, hey, look at it. the tables have turned now, though, right? Because I'm going back to my roots and I'm going back to the the small little mom and pop one store restaurants. Uh, so I, I'm I'm kind of switching it up for myself. But you know, I feel like we kind of did things opposite. I yeah. went corporate first, and now I'm getting into that scene. And and you 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 went you know into that scene first at per se and all those places that you worked, and then transitioned into corporate. So. Yeah, speaking about that, what made you want to get into fine dining now? Because you was doing, like, casual fine dining, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a lot more casual fare. Uh, you know, there's a struggle with the corporate industry, man. We got to talk about it. I mean, there, there has to be a conversation about it because you know as well as I do that the quality of 
product and the quality of food that you actually put out on a plate in a corporate restaurant when you're doing those 500, 600 seat restaurants and you're doing those massive numbers and those massive sales, you're not going to be putting out what you want to be putting out. You know, I I think that's the easiest way I could put it. Uh, Our company went through so many transitions with food, with the rising labor costs that coming across the board and everywhere, right? Like certain sacrifices had to be made and Earl's as a company, you know, they did a great job of trying to stay true to who they were and make everything in house when I first started with that company. But as they expanded and as they went down to the US and the company just got bigger and bigger and bigger, it became hard to kind of pinpoint that quality or that that perfect point where you're still making things in house you're still doing you know uh, due diligence to the craft Mm. of what we do but you know finding that balance is a tricky thing and you go through so many different phases of it and i've lived through that entire phase and for myself i hit this point where you know we started uh outsourcing a lot of things we got rid of our fresh bread program for instance you know when i got there these guys were doing uh and don't get me wrong it was it was a hell of amount of work but we were doing every single store had their own starter flown in from san francisco and we were doing our own san francisco sourdough in yeah. every single location you know awesome. we're talking about 60 60 locations across that north america and so to be able to say that you were making that fresh in house that doesn't happen like that, especially at the mm-hmm. sales that that company does. Uh, we were doing not only the sourdough, but we were doing fresh focaccia, which they still do today. I got to give them you know, respect for that. They make focaccia mm-hmm. every single morning. They will never, ever serve focaccia that is a day old. Uh, and they were doing fresh made brioche every single morning for every single hamburger you know and so when you you, that's my yeah exactly that's crazy right and so to think about that from a corporate perspective you're like well man that's a lot of cost Mm -hmm. Uh, so those are the things that they started sacrificing and having to outsource and you know with the volume and the company increasing and growing that was the step they had to take and for me as a chef i decided that you know well is is this what i'm comfortable doing i love the business part of it learning about the business part of it but is this really why I decided to cook in the first place? Is this really why I went to culinary school and wanted to learn all those techniques and everything, you know? I mean, I mean, you have to be fucking honest, brother. It's fucking difficult to make bread every fucking day. 110%. It is is a fucking challenge. It's a challenge, yes. Uh, For myself, you know, because I I face the same thing and I face that same dilemma. If I were to implement my own solution to a problem like that, you know, what I would do is I would give my locations if I, you know, let's say I was the executive chef of this company where I was the executive chef. I had 25 locations somewhere else all over the world. I would want my locations to kind of play off using local bakers and local ingredients and local Mm -hmm. stores and getting their products made by experts. You know, like you could still have fresh made bread every morning, but you're going to have somebody who only makes bread make that bread so you get the highest quality product with still not inducing that labor cost on yourself you know i mean yeah we we got that here we got tom cat we got hudson bread we got rockman bakery so you're talking about like big bake shops right exactly big bake shops or even the small guy you know you never know man like right next door you might have a great local baker who's struggling for business and to support the industry to support that culture of being like hey you know, if you guys can actually keep up with the volume of what we're doing, we'd love for you guys to make all of our bread fresh every morning, you know, I'm, instead of getting those big box shipments of that frozen pre-proofed or almost proofed or, or, you know, that kind of stuff like that just diminishes quality so so quickly. I mean, but let's be honest, sometimes your local bakery can't keep up. 100 percent, 110 percent, you know, and that, that that's the struggle that these local bakeries are going to face and stuff like that. But I do, you know, at the end of the day, if we were able to do it, you know, in one of my restaurants, we used to run one baker every shift. And that person was solely dedicated for eight to 10 hours a day, only making bread. It was very, very feasible to actually keep up with the volume of only having one person do it. So if we can do it on that volume, why can't a commercial or not even a commercial, but a bakery why wouldn't they be able to do that same thing you know so that's the question you kind of ask yourself okay yeah yeah it does make sense man i know i'm, I'm all against the whole 
you know, because because I'm a big fan of like the big breaking new places, man. I I put my fucking order in before I leave, and it comes in the morning. I don't have to fucking worry about it. But mm-hmm. I see, I see where you're getting at. Mm-hmm. Um, it's possible, but we got to find that balance. So I read, I read up about you a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, stalker much? Not really. I just read up some stuff. <laughs> 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 Um, why do you consider uh, Chef uh, Marco Pierre Wyatt as your role model, man? Oh, man. I mean, I know there's probably a whole bunch of reasons. I want to know why, though. Yeah, well, I think it dates back to, you know, I'd say 10 years ago now. I've been, I've been in the industry now since I got in my first cooking job. I was 15 years old. Uh, I'm 26 now, about to turn 27. So, you know, I haven't left the kitchen since then. But uh, I remember going back and when I first started kind of falling in love with food was in my early teenage years. Uh, It was Michael Smith, chef at home on the Food Network. And he's a Canadian chef. Uh, Shout out to him 100% because he was the guy, you know, I, I still remember every single day getting home from school, running in front of the TV, watching his episode and his famous catchphrase of, you know, the best recipe is cooking without a recipe. And I love that. I love that expression, that freedom, that kind of creative, artisanal, you know, okay. style of cooking. Uh, but then when I did my due diligence and my research is when I found out about Marco and his story and where he came from and what he did. And from, you know, being told right out of high school that it's yeah. like, hey, you're going to go find a job in a restaurant. Uh, that was kind of a very big, similar story to myself and him saying, well, if I'm going to go and be a chef and this is something that I'm actually going to do, I'm going to be the best at it. And I'm not going to let anybody in their critique and their kind of uh, opinions or I'm not going to let any of that get in my way to the point where he took it to the Michelin standard where he said, you know what? Who the fuck says that you guys know more about food than I do? I'm the chef. And he gave his stars back to me that I love that. I love that. Like, isn't that a crazy? And he was the first one to do that. You know what I mean? So the first celebrity chef who didn't give a shit about what opinions the media came out with about him. He didn't give a shit about, you know, who the dining, like even guests and customers. He didn't give a shit about what they had to say about his food. Because at the end of the day, who knows more about the food than the chef that created the food? And so their opinion was, yeah, oh, this is too salty or, oh, you know, I would do this this way or whatever. But he said, you know, I really don't give a fuck about what your opinion is. Who says that you know more about food than I do? And to me, that was like that romance piece of like, okay, that's where I could really connect and say, you know, it's not necessarily about what that guest's opinion is about your food. It's more so about your own expression of what you intended to put on that plate. And if it has thought and love behind it and passion behind it, then no one can tell you anything about about that. You know, and I really I really resonated with that. I mean, but, but let's be let's be real now, right? Time times has changed, right? So now now I feel like Michelin this Michelin God shit really doesn't matter anymore. I mean, just my opinion. I mean, it matters to some people, but now you got social media, right? Well, we don't even have Michelin in Canada. Oh no, no. I wasn't I was not aware of that. See, that's a big thing that a lot of people don't think of is that we don't even have the Michelin standard in Canada, and so that creates a completely different environment. You know, that it, it, that creates collaboration between chefs. It creates uh, good relationships and it removes a lot of competition between restaurants and the chefs in those restaurants. And I love that. I love that we don't have a guide here. And I'm fearful for when or if it does come. That's, I, was, I, I had no idea that's how it went down. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. We have Michelin star chefs, don't get me wrong, that have gone, you know, like we talked about uh, David Hawksworth and being one of the uh, the protégés of Marco Pierre White. Um, and so, you know, he was a three Michelin star chef for 10 years in Europe working underneath Marco. He actually was the head chef of one of Marco's restaurants. And so himself, like he, yeah, he opened a three star Michelin restaurant and did it successfully and ran it for years uh, and kept that kept that prestige but at the end of the day 
he didn't do it in Vancouver or he didn't do it in Canada. And because he didn't do it here, he's still, in my eyes, a three-star Michelin chef. But here he can express himself and he can he can really take that pressure of that Michelin standard off his back and just run very successful restaurants. And do what the fuck he wants to do. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's, 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 that's a big deal. So you you being up there, right? Would you ever find yourself did you ever find yourself wanting to work in New York City? Yeah, man, of course. Of course. I think every chef does. Uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to, you know, with food, man, you have the ability to see the world. Uh, yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter how you came up or what your upbringing was. It doesn't matter if you were rich, you were poor. None of that shit matters when you're in the kitchen because you're just another cook. You know what I mean? And uh, in New York, I feel like there's so much enriched heritage from so many different cultures and you guys have been doing it for so long right that learning from those people in that environment even if it's the cook right beside you on garmage at the end of the day man if you're learning from that guy he has some of that enriched heritage he has some of those learnings and those lessons that he brought on from the next person so i i love immersing myself in that kind of culture and those environments where all you're doing is taking a step back being a sponge and absorbing that information. I feel like New York has a lot of that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to do this thing now, right? Since I know, since, since I keep in contact with so many chefs, mm-hmm. I have I have uh, Chef Perry coming from London. He's coming. Well, I don't have him. He's coming f- for like vacation. Yeah. And he asked me, "Listen, do you know it's any way that I can get into a kitchen?" And I said, "Listen, if this shit passes, man, you know, I'll just, you know, I could definitely get you into the kitchen because." The dude's on vacation, but he, he says he's coming to New York. He wants to work at least one day in the kitchen, one full day in the kitchen. That's crazy. I do that same thing, man. If I'm in a city, I, I that's the that's one of the best things about me, like, or not even about me, but for me, sorry. You know, like I have the opportunity to be on vacation, and even if it's a day and I get to go spend it in a restaurant that I love, man, that to me is vacation. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's not my restaurant. I get to spend yeah. it doing the thing in the kitchen that I love doing, which is learning. That to me yeah. is a blessing. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 supposed to go to Paris with my wife for the next two years, and she already knows that I need one one day to be in the kitchen. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, hundred percent, man. It's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be amazing, man. I imagine. Um, okay, so moving on here, which what's, what's your biggest you know what? Let's get into something spicy, man. Mm. Have you have you ever gotten into a fight in the kitchen? What are we talking? Are we talking verbal or physical? Man, both. Like, what's the worst fight you ever got into? Like, <laughs> you ever punch a motherfucker in the face? You ever curse somebody the fuck out? Uh, I mean, uh, physically, uh, uh, the closest it's ever come uh, was a cook who thought that I was, you know, moving on to his station he thought i was kind of stepping on his toes we were mid-service uh and i had to run back from the line as we were i was in the plating section next to chef i was the saucier that night and uh he was the only one in the hot kitchen and so i think Mm -hmm. he misinterpreted you know things were going wrong there was a couple uh undercooked vegetables or whatever that chef had passed back to him and said hey i need you to recook this and i needed to grab something off my station while we had this quick little you know two second interval so i darted back to the kitchen really really fast uh you know came in hot around the corner and he just grabbed both my shoulders and shoved me and he's like get the fuck off my station and i looked at him you know and i i looked at him like first of all don't ever put your fucking hands on me again because like you know you when you when you take that professionalism out of the game you know what i mean like you're, you're pulling that out you're now challenging me as a man one-on-one you know to get physical with you and that and that's what that is to me this is no longer we're yeah. not chef and chef anymore we're not a cook and a cvp that, that that's not what this is that's not what this is this yeah. is you putting your hands on another man and you gotta you gotta realize that once you do that certain instincts are gonna kick in absolutely man and so you know i had to i had to tell him that right quick and i said it with a smile on my face and very respectfully a respectful kind of guy hey don't ever put your hands on me again. You do that, we're no longer at work, man. That's you and me. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. If you do it, I'm going to have to take you out, man. And it's not going to be Cut. good. It's not going to be pretty. You're damn right. That's how it should be, man. Absolutely. I don't, I, I don't put my hands on people. I think that's very disrespectful. I expect that same respect in return. And the fact that you break that, my guy, I'm sorry. That's something else. That's something different. And so, you know, right quick, he, he kind of saw the look on my face and took a step back. And he's like, all right, all right. And I'm like, okay. The sous chef came flying around the corner, heard the commotion. He's like, hey, deal with it the fuck after service. I said, yes, chef. Grabbed what I needed from my station and went right back to service, baby. That's, that's the bad. That means, yeah. I mean, you're a bigger... You're a bigger chef than me, too. I got you. plenty of fries in the kitchen, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, uh, we're Canadian. We're supposed to be polite and soft and all that jazz, right? But, hey, uh, don't, don't put your hands on another man. You Listen, don't expect... Man, that's, that's a myth. I know some fucking Canadians that are killers, man. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, we're just really good at hiding it. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um. So you said that there's a lot of uh, Asian people up there, right? Yeah, man. So yeah, do you feel like so? Do you feel like your cuisine is is Asian influenced or no? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, you know, coming up in uh, the Canadian, even just talking about Canada as a whole as a food scene, we are known as the country where everybody kind of wants to come into. You know, we're we're the one that is accepting. We have our doors open to a lot of different people, a lot of different cultures, from a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, it's not just recently. That's the way it's been for so many years. You walk into, God, I'm thinking back to like my elementary school days. If you were to come into my classroom, you're going to see five Asian kids that can barely speak English. You're going to see probably three, four white kids uh, that are actually born Canadian, you know, European heritage. You're okay. going to see a couple Latinos. You're going to see maybe one or two black guys. And you're going to see, you know, a handful of East Indian kids uh, all over the map. So every classroom kind of looks like the United Nations. You know what I mean? Like that, 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 that's what I refer to it as. Is we got everybody. Uh, and so coming up in that kind of food scene, you experience all those cultures. You take bits of knowledge from all of those cultures, flavor profiles, ingredients, all that kind of stuff. And you put it into your food. And I think that that's exactly what west coast food is you know west coast cuisine uh we take everything and we fuse it together and to make it something great that sounds like a big place oh it's beautiful too bro you guys are called what the glass something you guys are called the glass glass, glass towers the glass building something about because all your condos are just full of glass like oh yeah gold. yeah yeah you know it's, it's funny as we speak right now i'm sitting in uh, my solarium uh, I'm converting it to a garden room, so it's nice and empty. But I'm looking out on downtown right now, and you're right. Exactly, man, it is all glass. It, it's all glass. Yeah, man, I'm I'm dying to go up there, man. I'm I'm trying to convince my wife to go on a cruise that leaves that leaves from Seattle, but she hates fucking rain. Well, I mean, you got to come during the summer, man. Like, it, honestly, it hasn't rained here this week. Yeah, no, it hasn't rained at all this week, and it's pretty much going to stay the same temperature and get hotter and hotter as the season progresses. But we're we're past that rainy season. It's about I'd say four or five months out of the year that you get that consistent rain that really okay. sucks and is dismal. But besides that, man, it's a beautiful place to be. Okay. Yeah, man, I can't wait to go up there, man. Mm. So, um, Grand, what's it called? Grandville Public Market? What's it called? Grandville. Yeah. Grandville. Yeah. Did you, uh, if if you haven't yet, go on to Netflix and uh, there's that new show that David Chang put out. Oh come on, uh, bro! Absolutely, man. I'm a come on. I've been watching that, man. Come on, now. yeah, with Seth yeah. Rogen. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, that's why I'm man. asking you all these questions, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that that that's the spot. That's the spot. So how how big is that market, man? Because you know we have markets like that here, but I don't think it's like to that like extent of a market. Well, it's basically its own little island, really. Uh, yeah, it's it's an island full of just artisan shops and very, very, uh, how do you describe it? Like, 
just the most artisan that you can get. You've got this big market where you've got all these people from all these farms selling their vegetables that they grow either locally or came from, you know, not too far away. Uh, and you've got, you know, these, these vendors inside of that same place that make their own knives, for instance. There's a knife guy there that I'm in contact with right now. He's making me a set. Um, it's awesome. He, and he does it himself it's like you I, I went i saw his booth his little kiosk where he's selling his pieces made a quick connection with him blah 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 we end up going and uh you know he's gonna make me my own knife set that's gonna be custom made and, and fit for my hand uh specifically fit for my hand so you know that kind of stuff is that that level of uh crass craftsmanship that's exactly what the word is to describe it that that word right there describes it perfectly you got so many of the people doing their thing out there whether it's plateware whether it's lip balm whether it's honey whether it's uh salts spices any of it and that's where they all gather is on uh, granville island so oh, that's fucking dope yeah man it's a beautiful place if um if you could sit down with uh, three culinary gods dead or alive who who would it be? I mean, like, to either cook for or just have a conversation with? Oof. I don't think I would cook for any culinary gods. Uh, not yet, <laughs> anyways. I'm still, young, I'm still a young guy, you know what I mean? But uh, if I did cook for them, it would only be to get their critique and their feedback. I, I love that. Uh, I, I love cooking something for somebody and hearing their opinion on it and, you know, what they, what they would do differently and hear their kind of critique i, I love that because i think it really refines dishes uh but i would have to say to have a conversation with or just to share you know a couple bourbons over uh marco pure white obviously of course. gotta be yeah. number one uh grand Ackett's in chicago yeah. i would love yeah. that just to explore his mind a little bit and his creativity and his process you know a more in-depth understanding uh and i'd say dan barber i really mm. i really love Dan okay. Barber. yeah it's a big one for me you know it's 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 funny you say grand right because i'm a i'm a huge fan of thomas keller and you know he came from the first yeah 100 percent. right so you know a, a lot of chefs give me shit saying oh you should you should why, why thomas keller why not you know why not somebody else let me tell you something man when i first Got into cooking. Mm. It was through the Food Network, man. I'm, yeah. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. All of us. Um, did, yeah. yeah I, I was a big, big fan of Emeril and Bobby Flay. Okay. Right? Then I started working at this place. And the chef, the chef, actually, it was Le Cirque, man. And the, uh, wow. there, was this black, there, there was this black chef there. And he was telling me, man, he said, he asked me, who's your favorite chef? And I told him it was Bobby Flay. He looked at me and laughed. And he gave me a copy of the French Laundry. Mm-hmm. And I, I went home and I, I fucking started reading that book, man. And I've never took fine dining so serious since that time. It was insane. Man. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then it's funny because I got to meet Bobby Flay one time. Right? Okay. And yeah. it, 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 it was in Ice University. And... I he's he's in the hallway and I go to shake his hand. I'm I'm gassed up. He says, "Kid, if it's not about money, don't waste my fucking time." And he walked away. Wow. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So I I saw that and I said, "These fucking arrogant TV chefs. I can't fucking stand them. I hate a fucking TV chef." You know. Mm. So ever <laughs> since that day, I started doing my research and I started finding out about Danielle. You know. Mm-hmm. About Jean George and working at Le Cirque, um, the chef was the chef was cool with people, and he made me do he he made me stage. And I had I had the opportunity to to work at a Valet Chateau property. Okay. And that's the same property that Thomas Keller works for. Wow. And I don't know what the owner did or what kind of strings he pulled, but. I got a, a, a French Laundry book signed by Thomas Keller. Wow. And, and it says to Chef Moses, when he says to it's all about finesse. And let me tell you something, man. That book is in my mom's safe and it's not leaving ever. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, it's I not, imagine that, bro. You know? So, you know, just 
you know, it's just I take you know a lot of people don't don't think that I take this culinary shit seriously, but I do. You know, just because I left fine dining doesn't mean that I don't have a love for it. Yeah, just because I was in corporate for five years, I doesn't mean I didn't respect the game and respect that culture either. You know. Yeah, I mean, we we, we all we all no matter where is that man, we all we all work behind the house and it all looks the fucking same, man. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's a little different in there, but it's the same shit, man. Yeah, just the complexity, I feel like, changes. You know, that's the only thing that really changes. But a saucier station in the corporate restaurant and a saucier station that you have uh, in Per Se or Le Cirque, they're going to be similar. There's going to be those similarities. It's just the complexity of the dishes that you're actually making. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 33, man. I turned 34 this year. My body Looking can't keep age. up. My body can't keep up. <laughs> My body can't keep up with fine dining restaurants, man. <laughs> oh man, yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that. Yeah, man. I mean, like, man, man like you said, you're 26, man. So just go, go as hard as you can, man. Well, that's my goal, man. I mean, the next, you know, I, I was kind of 25 when I left that, uh, <clears throat> left the casual fine dining scene, and I kind of made a proclamation. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. It was on Instagram, and it kind of caused a little bit, <laughs> caused a little bit of havoc. There's a lot of people that were kind of uh, questioning it, but I, I kind of put casual fine dining, uh, not casual fine dining, but I put the corporate restaurant game on, on blast a little bit. You know, I said, if you walk up to your head chef and you ask him what the master sauces are, and that chef cannot answer them, then you are in the wrong place, learning from I- the wrong person. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> man. <laughs> and a lot of people were very upset by that. They're like, "Well, what do you mean? Like, blah 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 blah." But it caused the conversation, and you know that's what I try to do with my content. I try to cause that conversation, or have those cooks that are I've met in my past in those corporate restaurants actually ask themselves, take a look in the mirror, man. Tell me that you're happy about the food that you're putting out. Tell me that when you, before you went to fucking culinary school, that you imagined that you were going to be steaming that that feature soup that's about to roll out in the steamer, opening it out of a fucking bag and dumping it into a hot holder. Tell me that's what you decided that you were going to do with your career. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, if, if that's what you're happy with, then all power to you, bro. Good for you. You, you found the place that makes you happy and you're in a place that I'm not disregarding or talking down on that whatsoever. I, di- I did it for years. But if that was not the place that you imagined yourself working at the age and the stage in your career that you're at, then you got to make a change for yourself. Yeah, man. Yeah, this, I mean, I'm not going to lie, man. There's times where I miss, I miss the line and I miss the action. You know what I'm saying? And oh yeah, man, it's, it's getting home at three, four, five in the morning. It's it's great, man. But you know, oh, well, I, I don't you. think <laughs> I don't think anybody really likes getting home at three, four, five in the morning. Like, not anybody's a fan of that. But I will say that you know when I I, I remember the first week that I spent, uh, you know, kind of taking over and stepping into a much larger role in my company. I spent my entire first week off the line and behind a laptop and it was writing budgets and reporting numbers and sending emails, writing schedules and dealing with invoicing and dealing with uh, meetings and dealing with seminars and all this other kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking about it and I'm like, man, this isn't why I decided to go to culinary school. I mean, but how old were you doing this though? Man, I was young. I was young. young. But the fact, the fact that you got, listen, you can't be mad at yourself for that because the fact that you got up, that fast on that ladder at a young age, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it says a lot, man. Yeah, I mean, I there's a lot of chefs that I meet like now, especially going into these fine dining places that are like, oh, this new kid coming in. I, I still go stage. I still go stage. If I have a friend's restaurant or I, I know somebody in the kitchen that has you know a great connection for me and I, I really respect what they're doing with food, I will go and spend my time and volunteer it there happily, happily just to learn from those people. And so... I, I walk in and I get that kind of stink eye of like, yo, this kid used to be a head chef or he used to do X, Y, Z. He, he mm-hmm. should know X, Y, Z, you know, but I go in with the, with the mindset of a student. Treat me like I don't know anything. That's, that's why I'm here. 
but that's how you should go in somewhere, though, know, right? Yes, yes. Like, when I was still working in these restaurants, that's how I would go in, right? I would go in as a sous chef, but I still want to start off working garmage and work my way yeah. up for two weeks, and then I'll get on Expo. That's exactly. how it should be. 100%. 100%. Some of these kids in these industry these days standing in those pastures, man, they, you ever peel 25 fucking pounds of potatoes? You ever, you ever have to peel a hundred pounds of fucking potatoes for your mise en place? Have you ever had to brunoise, uh, mirepoix all the way down? You know, you got to make what, five kilos of brunoise mirepoix Oof. for chef and just have it ready to go. You ever do that? You haven't done that yet. Okay, great. If you are standing in a pasture right now using fucking tweezers, but you haven't made it past that stage, then go back and relearn what the fuck you got to learn, because you have to you have to learn that. So do me a favor and explain, because I know I might no disrespect to to the like my boy in a uh, um, my boy Perry calls him in London starter chefs. For the starter chefs that don't know what staging means, can you please explain? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, a stage is basically your trial period. You know, it's it's where you go and you determine, or as a chef, uh, the best way I can describe it is in the perspective of a chef, if this was my kitchen. I would bring a stage in and I would have them interact with the team for a day. I would give them some very simple instructions and, and kind of leave them unsupervised here and there. Um specifically just to see how that person worked, right? Because a lot of these kids come in these days and they, they left culinary school or they have three, four, fuck it. I don't even care if you have five years experience underneath your belt. You know what I mean? I need to see what kind of person you are, not where you've worked on a black and white piece of paper. Hmm. I got to see if you're going to get along with the kitchen team. I got to see if you're going to be communicative. I got to see if you're going to ask questions when you don't understand something. I got to see how clean you work. I got to see that. That's what matters to me more so than you coming in and saying, oh, I worked here, 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 here. And I've done this, 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 and this. And this is my expected wage. This is what I want. You know, like that's all great and good, bro. But if you can't throw down when we need you to throw down, then why are you here? If you can that's, handle, if you can handle the pressure, right? Exactly, exactly. And so that stage, whether it's a day or whether it's a week or whatever the case may be, you know, every chef is different. Uh, but that that's your chance to kind of prove who you are as a chef. And a lot of people, I think, a lot of these young starter chefs kind of coming up, they don't understand and comprehend what the chef is actually looking for. And it's not the job of the chef to tell you what he's looking for. Just so let, let, let's make sure that that's clear first. It's your job as somebody who's trialing to get a job to prove what you can do. And if what you can do is not know something and have the balls to go up to somebody else and ask for the correct answer, the correct procedure, or humble yourself down and ask for you know instruction and guidance, then I'm hiring that person. But if the person that you are is the person who thinks that they have to have all the right answers and they're insecure about where they're at in their career, wherever the case may be, and you make a mistake because you decided to proceed with a task without getting full clarification of that task, hey, that's not going to work out for me, man. You can't, you can't pull moves like that. Hmm. You know? Simple. Absolutely not. So... Okay, touch base on that. Now, let's just uh, let me go back to the questions real quick. Have my yeah. editor edit this out. Okay, so which um, do you feel like what which restaurant that you worked at you feel like you learned the most? Whew. Uh yeah, it's a, it's kind of a two part thing, you know. I feel like where I learned the most about operations, management, leadership, myself, metrics, food costs, balance of all of that. I feel like I learned the most of that at a corporate restaurant uh, with Earl's. I, I was okay. working for numerous years, you know, and so I got to give them that big respect because without, you know, as well as I do, you have to be a chef that can balance all of that, right? Like that, that that's your job once you do have a restaurant and somebody's invested into you, you're protecting somebody else's wallet. Uh, and so without that, 
and just knowing how to cook, guess what? If you're not making the shareholders money, you're not going to be successful. You're not going to be experimenting as much as you want to be, bro. And so, you know, you have to know both. Uh, I feel like a lot of people miss that. You know, I meet a lot of cooks these days in these fine dining kitchens and chefs, even sous chefs or people that have worked in these Michelin star restaurants. And I ask them, hey, like, what's your total operation cost of the kitchen? Or, uh, hey, can you tell me what our theoretical food cost is? Or what's your budgeted food cost for the year? Uh, you know, all these questions that to us corporate guys, you hear that and you're like, oh, yeah, I can tell you like the back of my hand because I know my I know my numbers like that. Uh, but a lot of the the people that quote unquote, have the most experience in all these fantastic kitchens, they can't answer that. They can't. And so, you know, that, that kind of shows that difference between the both. You could be a great chef and know how to cook, but fuck it, man. You can't make money. You're not actually not going to be a great chef. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not going to work out for you, you know? Uh, so I, I pay homage to Earl's for that. I, I do. I respect that company so much. And, you know, we, we did, uh, we did great things together. They, they taught me so much, I, nothing but great things to say about that company. Um, but for food and culinary and like actually like the artists and craft of, of making something from scratch and balancing flavors and all these different things, I have to say that uh, David Hawksworth's commissary kitchen uh, okay. where I, I held a role there as the uh, the senior sous chef for the catering department. Uh, so as I was doing that, I was working underneath uh, Chef Stephanie Leanne, amazing, amazing, amazing French-Canadian chef. Uh, you know, big shout-outs to her. Uh, she was a mentor. She was a teacher. She was a guide, you know, a, a guide as to what food was for me every single day I, I was so excited to get up and rip the sheets off my bed and run into work every single morning because i knew that she was going to be there and she was going to teach me something different and she was going to make sure that if she was doing something that she knew i knew or i, I didn't know how to do she would yell <laughs> she would <laughs> she would scream and she'd be like dion you know and i, I yes chef and i'd be right beside her and she'd be like here I'm going to teach you how to how to break down a rabbit. I'm going to teach you how to take apart, you know, this 40 pounds of, of squid that we have. And so that type of mentor you don't necessarily get very often. You don't find that that those people very often in the industry, especially in that higher level of dining. And so I was very, very appreciative to to that experience for sure. Awesome. Damn. <laughs> yeah, man. You had a fucking experience, man. Um, so I'm gonna ask you two more questions, man. The the first one's gonna be easy, then the last one's gonna be a little difficult. Oof. Okay. So first one, what dish you first made that had you feel like, yo, I, I can rock with this culinary shit. Like I got it. <laughs> uh yeah, it goes back to uh I think like junior high school, high school for me, man. Uh my mom, I was raised in a single mother household. Okay. Uh, so my mom held two jobs uh, while trying to go to school and get, you know, she ended up graduating school. So, you know, shout out awesome. to her for doing that, to for being a single mother and she had two kids. Hey, respect to all those women out there. That, that shit is not easy to do. You know, now being a parent, looking back at that, like, wow like that hard work and dedication from our immigrant parents. You know what I mean? They, they really held it down. They really put it, put that work in. Uh, and so yeah. she, she, um, she worked late. She worked late all the time. And I have a little sister um, and she uh, would come home from school and I would come home from school. I'd be home just a little bit earlier than her, a little bit later. And sometimes we'd have to fend for ourselves for dinner. You know, it was a casual thing that happened or a normal thing that happened when mom got stuck at work. Uh, and so my mom, made it a point to kind of take me through uh, how to cook some basic dishes, basic dishes. So my mom actually, you know, funny story, she wanted to be a chef. Uh, she went to culinary school and lasted <laughs> about two, three months. Uh, and the reason why was she, wow. she said, you know, I, I stopped going to culinary school. I stopped showing up to class. I dropped out and I asked her why. And she said, um, you know, she's a strong Latina blooded El Salvadorian woman <laughs> and mm. having a chef come over uh, and stand over her shoulder 
uh, and be like, nah, you put too much of this in, or yes, you put too much of this, or you didn't put enough of this, or whatever. She was not she, with it. Oh, not not at all. No, she was not about that. She'd be like, you know, that's just not how she was raised. That's not how things happen in that Latin household. You know what I'm talking about. Absolutely, was strong. Bro. <laughs> and so she actually decided to go into the field of psychology. Uh, but, you know, she taught me just a couple basic basic dishes. One of them was uh, just a simple spaghetti bolognese. And mm. I was 14, maybe 15. And she she taught me, like, not not the standard bolognese where, you know, you're, you're in the hood and you open up a jar of fucking sauce and blah, blah, blah. No, like, that's not what she taught me. She taught me, <laughs> like, hey, you're going to do this. You're going to do it fucking right. You are going to core your tomatoes, right? You're going to make tomato concasse, and then you're going to fucking take your concasse, and you're going to boil it down into a sauce, and you're going to, you know, brown up some ground beef. You're going to do it properly. And so I remember the first day that she was stuck at work, and it wasn't the first time I made this dish, uh, but it was the first, you know, in, in my memory at least, time that I said, you know what? I'm actually going to add a little something different uh, to the sauce today that I just think would go well with it. And it was cinnamon. I know it sounds mm. wild. I know it what? sounds wild. Yeah, no, 100%, bro. I, I, I don't do it anymore. I did at that time, you know, because I, I was really familiar with that flavor and uh, try to, you know, actually, you know, go try that shit out. Go put a little sprinkle of ground cinnamon in your bolognese sauce after you have your meat and all that stuff and finish it off, serve it to somebody and they're going to taste it and they're going to be like, oh man, like what's that? what's that familiar flavor I'm tasting or what's that? I, I know what it is, but I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? Like it's, it, it's just, it gets good. It goes with everything. It goes with all the spices and et cetera, et cetera. But what is that? And that was what I did. I, I created that moment. So, you know, I, my mom came home from work and I'm like, mom, 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 try this sauce. And she tried it and she looked at me and she's like, what's in there? Like, what is that? Like, it's good. It's so good. But like, what is that? You know, and that feeling or that moment right there, that moment, to me, I was like, I can fuck with this culinary shit. That's awesome. This to me is cool. This experience is cool. That's awesome. You yeah. Know, it's, but... it, it, it's funny because I used to work with this Asian chef at Tribeca Grill. Mm-hmm. And he, um, I used to eat, he used to make family meal salads. And even his, 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 his regular mixed green I'd be like, yo, what the fuck is that on the salad? It's so good. You put something in here. And for like three days, I'm like, dude, what the fuck? And it was mint, bro. Right? He would slice mint and put it into his mixed greens. Just a little bit. It's a little bit. And it was fucking bomb. It was so yeah. good, man. Well, think about that freshness of flavor, man. Like, I, I love throwing herbs in a good fucking salad. A chef salad, are you kidding me? Yeah, throw some parsley good, leaves man. in there. You throw some mint in there. You, you know, just kind of get it. That flavor pop that catches you off guard. That's why people go to restaurants in the first place. Yeah. They go, don't go to restaurants because they want to eat shit that they can make at home. They want to be surprised. They want to be caught off guard. You know, and, and, and to be able to do that to somebody or offer them that experience. And we're chefs, man. We're fucking egotistical. We're, we're, we're rough around the edges. But we like to offer nothing but pleasure to absolutely everybody. Like, that is something I have to say to a lot of chefs. And so, you know, to offer that experience of like, oh, wow, what is that? Or what did they, what, you know, even if on the drive home, one of my guests thinks, hey, Yo, what was that one spice or what was that one herb he used in that one dish, man? I'm going to think about it. I, I, it's going to come to me, but I'm just going to keep on thinking about it. To me, I did my job. To me, that's exactly what we're here for, you know? Awesome. Yeah. All right. As this is so, the last question I say, because I felt like, you know, uh, you, on your bio, you said something about understanding the balance of flavors. Oh. You said... For you, cooking is understanding the balance of flavor, right? That's what you said, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, can you explain I that? said that. Can, can you explain that just a little more? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think of the word contrast. You know, balance is a big one, but contrast is a second. I feel like they both go hand in hand. Um, whenever I'm coming up with a dish or you know, I'm trying to cook at home, whenever it is, I think of contrast. Uh, 
let's take an example of making uh, let's talk about my last instagram post that i put up of food it was this uh pasta it was just a baked rigatoni very simple comfort food for your, your home you know what i mean uh so i, I put that up but it, when i was making that dish i was still going through my head i'm like okay so you eat the rigatoni and you get that mouth feel from the pasta that's awesome you get the smoothness from that sauce that's kind of coating every single piece of that pasta and filling up all those holes of that rigatoni. Uh, you get, you know, a little bit of chunkiness from the meat, but not ex- necessarily a hard texture at all in your mouth. What can I add to this? What's going to contrast out all those soft and delicate textures in my mouth feel with something a little bit crispy, you know? And so you add a little bit of a crispy uh, panko gremolata on top or something like that. And now you've taken that dish that was one note that was just so, you know, kind of parallel to everything else that's kind of combined with it. And you're adding something crunchy. Well, that's that contrast. That's that's, that's that soft and that crispy at the same time in your mouth. Hmm. And so I I think of all the different uh, kind of ways that I can play off of that and uh, you talk about temperature contrast. Well, if you're serving a dessert and you're a great per- pastry chef, you know that if you put something hot and warm on the plate and a little bit of like a, a sorbet or an ice cream on top of that, well, that's that contrast. You've got yeah. hot and cold. You know what I mean? Um, you're talking about flavor now and you've got salty, sweet, spicy, sour, umami, all of those different contrasts and what are the elements within a plate? What are the elements within one bite that's actually going to be able to offer you all of those different things and check every single one of those boxes? Uh, To me, whenever I'm making a dish or I'm thinking about a dish, that is the one thing that I always like to keep in my head is uh, how can I, what is the element of spicy? What is the element of sauce? Uh, You know, where it all came from was a, uh, a quote actually from uh, Hessen Blumenthal, uh, three Michelin star chef of the Fat Duck in London. Uh, if anybody didn't know, go check out his stuff. He's a legend. Uh, but he said, uh, think of something uh, in its purest form, something like a passion fruit puree. It's mm. strong. It's vibrant. You taste it all at once, right? Yes. And like that, that's that flavor. Uh, but then you even take that further and it goes talking about you know kind of balancing flavor and it says every forkful uh, must contain salt acid and heat seasoning should never be detected you broke up a little bit repeat that please okay yeah give me one quick second actually you know what give me give me two seconds let's edit this out i have bread rising my timer just went off (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, so, you know, there was that quote, Heston talking about that, uh, Heston, when he talked about, you know, that kind of passion fruit parade, he said, if you take the same puree and make it into a jelly and then cut it into cubes, it will slowly melt on your tongue and you will get the flavor little by little as the dish goes on. The flavor releases, the flavor release, I guess, would take longer because you've you've converted that passion fruit puree into something solid that's slowly going to melt on your palate you know that's and dope. So, that's dope as shit right because yeah. i heard that and i was like oh my god that makes so much sense and so if i want that passion fruit to kind of last in that dish and i want it to be not only at the start but the finish of every single bite well the state of matter that it's in and that contrast all kind of comes back to that and so I, I absolutely love that. I love that he said that. When I when I do create any type of dish or when I am cooking, those are the things that I think about is like, how can I balance this out with all these different uh, flavors and all these different tastes and all these different things that are going to hit your palate? Like, how am I going to make this happen? And that's, that's where I go with it. Fucking amazing, bro. Fucking awesome. Um, listen, man, I appreciate you. Uh being a part of this today, man. It means a lot. I know me and you have been, been, been connecting for like the past five, six years, but I'm happy we finally got yeah. to sit down and talk straight for like an hour, man. It's cool. Yeah, man, me too. Long time coming. 
Yeah, man. Um, like I said, man, I, I wish you a whole bunch of success, man. I, I know you out there trying to do your own thing and you're freelancing and you're getting busy. So I hope it all works out, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. A couple, couple big projects on the way, but we're not going to talk about anything yet until something, something, you know, especially with COVID and everything going on right now. <laughs> uh, but but soon enough, soon enough, you'll see you'll see a lot more of me on social media and be more prominent there for sure. Awesome, man.